So now, when we have finished with the first four, uh, with the first um, speakers, we would like to go into panel discussion. And um, I would like to introduce uh, the moderator of the first pa panel, James Taylor Foster. Um, James is a Stockholm-based writer, editor, designer, and broadcaster, working in the fields of architecture, design, e-culture, and technology. He is the creator of contemporary architecture and design at ACDES, Sweden's National Center for the Architecture and Design, formerly European editor at large at Arch Daily, the world's most uh, visited architecture platform. He has practiced architecture in the UK and the Netherlands. In 2016, he co-curated the Nordic Pavilion at the 15th uh, Architecture Biennale, and in 2018, at the 16th Biennale, he participated in the central exhibition called Free Space. Please, welcome, James. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I've got two microphones. First of all, I'm going to invite Eva's Justinian and Kirsten up to take a seat. Uh, there is an elephant in the room, which is the massive burning Brexit sign that was just above Justinian's head. I'm sure we'll come back to that in a second, because naturally, I am British. I'm going to pass this around here. But I live in Sweden. Uh, who's been to Sweden? Nearly everybody. Does anybody want to shout out uh, a word that might describe what Swedish society means to you, or how Sweden projects itself, its identity, onto the world? You're going to have to shout. A moral superpower, absolutely. La gom. Not too much and not too little. Recycling. Exactly. These are all good words. These are all words that sort of make sense. We are rich. Uh, wealth, absolutely. Um, you know, as, as someone who was, who was born in the United Kingdom, uh, in, in between London and a very small city called Lincoln, uh, I didn't realize how strange the UK was until I left the UK. And I moved to the Netherlands first, and then I moved to Italy, and now I'm in Sweden. But I also didn't quite realize how strange Sweden was until about a year and a half of living there. Europe, just to focus in a little bit, is a place which is full of contradictions and paradoxes and cultural signifiers, unity and differences. Uh, and I think that the narrative that is told, or the multiple narratives that are told to, to jump on your discussion, Justinian, um, are very, very reductive. Uh, I often say that most countries in Europe appear to be superficially the same. Um, no, excuse me, superficially different. Uh, different languages, different food, all sorts of things like that. Deep down, the same. The Nordic region, and when I talk about the Nordic region, to a certain degree, we have to also now talk about the Baltic region. Um, as far as the Nordic Council, of, the Nordic Council and the ministry, which encompasses Finland, Sweden, Norway, Iceland, and increasingly Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. Um, these countries are superficially different, especially in Scandinavia. Um, superficially the same. God, my entire, my entire metaphor is completely wrong. Superficially the same, and deep down very different. I have never, ever had to do a full 180 twist in my, in my brain more than moving to Sweden. And my introduction to the Baltic region was quite interesting because it was through a very strange project called the Baltoscandic Confederation, which was a proposal for a new nation conceived of in 1925 by a Lithuanian theorist, Kazis Pakstis. Has anyone heard of the Baltoscandic Confederation? Yeah, it is absolutely fascinating. I will give you a very brief summary of what the plan was. The plan was to unite into one nation, Scandinavia and the Nordic region and the Baltic countries, into a new country called the Baltoscandic Confederation. This was just after the First World War, prior to the Second World War. And Pakstis had an incredible idea of how this would unify, or the role that this new country would play in the world. At the time, he saw the great power as being the United Kingdom and the United States. 
Why were they powerful? Well, they were essentially island nations. And the ancient Greek word, philocracy, sea power, was very important in that time. These two countries together dominated the oceans. And he believed that there needed to be a new country that would not only act as a buffer between the perceived east and the perceived west, but also to act as a counterpoint to the great philocracy. It would be, in his words, the philocracy minor, a second sea power. He also wrote a book about this, which talked about how the political structure of this nation would be developed. It was absolutely fascinating. He sort of said, well, we can probably use the Swiss model of cantons. Um, we probably need a king or a monarch or something. And since Sweden is the biggest, we'll just make the king of Sweden the emperor of Baltuscandia. And around that, we'll have proportional voting systems. And, but, you know, the whole thing is interesting because as a concept, it didn't really gain much traction as much as he tried. He lectured across Europe on this idea. But what we start to see now, especially this last decade, is the coming together of the Baltic region with the Nordic region, however superficially or, or deeply as, as you might perceive. But there are infrastructural projects such as Rail Baltica, there are projects of political unity being created that in some ways demonstrate this strange utopian idea of the 1920s coming into some sort of fruition. At the same time, as I said, I'm British and I live in a country which is highly bureaucratic as most social, socialist countries are. There's not that much difference between China and Sweden except in one you choose to trust the government, another you're forced to, a controversial statement to some. But as a British citizen who is being removed uh, without my consent from the European Union, there's been a massive identity crisis, no? Is what am I, um, what are we? Um, Sweden is going to, if there is no deal with Brexit, put me through an incredibly fascinating bureaucratic process to sort of define who I am in, in that country. And in a country which, which, you know, tells itself critically through popular culture, if you are into British TV, you may have noticed that the last five to 10 years has seen an incredible resurgence in hyper nostalgic popular culture. The most expensive TV show ever made is called The Crown. And it's a story about a person who lives, the queen, and how she came to power trying to humanize her, but also demonstrate the deep mythological relationship that the population of the United Kingdom seemed to have with their monarch. Around all this, we then have an identity crisis. An identity crisis which we see is stretching deep into the past, I would argue, more than into the present. A moment of trying to emphasize what power is in the world. And of course, it's all a complete joke. This is a tiny island in which really has had extreme influence, but does not anymore, and especially does not outside of the European Union. So we're in this kind of fragile sort of tectonic moment. No? And migration, or expatriism, which is a very interesting point to make, is absolutely part of the human story. It's been going on for a very, very long time in much greater numbers than we have seen, for example, in Europe in the last three or four or five years. But it's intensifying. And I want to just bring up here someone who means a lot, I think, within this discourse, which is Sigmund Bauman, the sociologist Sigmund Bauman. A uh, sociologist who was born in Poland, eventually fled to Israel, to Australia, and settled in the United Kingdom, who conceived of the idea of liquid modernity. Uh, liquid modernity is essentially the smelting, melting, liquefaction of the societies that we live in, a moment in which institutions are not trusted, a moment in which we are all moving away from the local into a global condition and are therefore groping in the dark as we try to understand how to make sense of this. What comes into that question is absolutely social media and the fact that, you know, societies have had difficult moments around the world since the dawn of time, but if a civilization collapsed a thousand years ago, there was other civilizations that might continue elsewhere in the world. We are so globally connected now that I think there's a very real risk that the entire civilization might descend at once. Information is power, but information is also uh, an enormous responsibility. So with that, uh, I want to just begin by raising a very, very simple question to stem from Justinian's presentation, which is the idea of the narrative. Your narrative was extremely interesting. Your narrative, Kirsten, was very interesting. Your narrative was very interesting. And 
you know, to begin with the question of, of cybersecurity, to begin with the question of digital fluid citizenship, as Estonia is demonstrating perhaps more uh, aggressively than any other country in Europe or the world right now, what is your, what is your genuine perception of this? Is this a viable direction? E-residency, e-citizenship, fluid nationality. Well, certainly Estonian e-residency project is really a good one. <laughs> and I think it might serve well for people who have to find some solutions uh, being in Europe but living in London or, or you know, for business because you can establish a digital identity not being in Estonia and you can continue to run the business with the European Union is a legal entity. Uh, not uh, not requiring physical presence. I think we will see solutions like that very many because it is a brand new world with the technologies and it's very at the very beginning. So I think there will be more countries, more companies reinventing, you know, the citizenship, identity, you know, who are we, the digital, all kind of aspects. So. I think it's too early to say what will work and what will be the best solution, but that the, the path is there and everybody is looking and reinventing, that's obvious. Uh, but uh, I think in a broader spectrum, what, what we all talked here in a, in a different aspects is, of course, for me, what bothers is like, who are we as, a, as a humans in this uh, very big change of the world? Uh, that has been currently, I have a feeling, abused more and more every sort of day and year. And we have to kind of go back to the basics and figure out uh, how we as a society, as a humans, as people are stronger, not weaker with the technologies that we are developing. And right now, I'm not quite sure where that balance is still thing. And, and that's, that's probably one of the reasons why people also do go back local, they do look they do search for those identities that will connect, connect them, that will feel them uh, engaged with something, that they can feel themselves as a real, real bonds with some other. There's a beautiful book written by Francis Fukuyama on identity. I, if, if anybody wants to dig into that, and uh, there are multiple aspects of how he sees uh, why we are all challenged and how much of that is being used by populism, how, that, how much that is abused, how much we do define ourselves or others and who we are that then more against, sort of we saying what, we define ourselves being against something that comes very much into a sort of immigration debate that when we are at loss and we don't know who we are, we rather going positive, we go negative, defining that we are not them and that sort of deepens the split. But uh, I think there will be, you know, going back to digital, I think there will be more uh, all kind of uh, options explored. But I don't see yet one uh, sort of solution for all. No, absolutely. And I think you touched upon, I mean, the basic question which I think I, you said was, you know, how do we belong? And, and that always sparks within me the idea of, of what it means to integrate. And the word integration is becoming, yeah, it's, it's very, very shaky word, um, very, very ill-defined or, or sort of micro-defined, but it connects to, I think, what you described about an airport, for example. An airport, um, Kirsten, is, is a place where you want to feel welcome, you said, where you want to, to feel comfortable. That is a form of integration, to me, a very small notion in comparison to coming to a country and having to understand a way of life. Um, increasingly, I would argue, and feel free to disagree with me, we've got one microphone that we have to baton around or I can share in mind. Um, integration is something which is, uh, well, I mean, maybe, maybe a way to start to say, how do you define, especially as someone who's an engineer working in the biggest architecture practice or design practice in the world, which, by the way, comes with incredible responsibility. <laughs> How, how do you define this notion of integration from, from all sorts of scales, from an, from an airport to a residential building to an office building? Do you have those discussions inside the practice? Oh, yeah, so that's a wide open question, but of course, yes, we do. And uh, I think the, you, know, you were talking about the idea of people's uh, identity, and we really, we, you know, we've been doing a lot of research on it, on the kind of whole idea of experience and satisfaction, and place is hugely important. Um, we are, you know, creatures of nature. We are creatures of land. 
and and the the environments that we are uh, are put ourselves into our experience they really help to define us and make us comfortable you know and, and where you want to be is one the place that you want to be safe and it means different things for different people um, but the you know the whether it is you you want to be able to see a lot of expanse you need that wide open spaces or you feel that you like to have you know kind of smaller nest that the 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 we, we really want to have ourselves grounded. And as you travel um, or as you, as you migrate, you're always looking for those places where I feel comfortable. And, um, and I think the, 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 the important thing that we have to uh, continue as, as, as designers is making sure that the spaces that we've designed, whether they're large airports or whether they are you know, schools or whether they are housing, um, do speak and be unique to the place that they are in. We should not be designing something in Abu Dhabi that is identical to that that's in Stockholm. It's just that, you know, the, the cultures are different, the geology is different, the geography is different, the nature is different, they should be different. Um, the climates are different. And, the, and, and you want them to be, you need to have them be re reflective of space. That's also then going to help people say, yeah, this is my home. This is, I, I feel it, right? I feel I'm comfortable here. Is that an aesthetic question more than anything? Could you expand on that a little bit? Like what, because there's also things to be learned from say Stockholm to Abu Dhabi and Abu Dhabi absolutely. to Stockholm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What, what in that, in your opinion, what suddenly makes that idea of a local character make itself apparent? Because also right. in Abu Dhabi, if we compare, for example, airports, uh -huh. uh, Abu Dhabi airport is, is more resourced and uh, extremely extravagant and a kind of architecture that would not be possible in other parts of the world because of taste and, and aesthetic yeah. concerns. Is it, that, is it that simple or am I just reducing it too much? I don't, I don't think, I mean, I like to make things simple because people want to understand them. I do understand, you know, c certainly can, can empathize with the concerns of when we make things too, too simple and that goes off, off the radar. And Abu Dhabi is, I mean, that a lot of the Middle East airports, they are what we call over the top, without a doubt. Um, but the, uh, the, 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 the importance of kind of vernacular local architecture, you know, it's one of those things that as engineers, we're all about the data. We like the quantified stuff, and architects love the qualified things. And that's, you know, you're trained and you understand there. It's much more nebulous. It's much more difficult to say, you know, here's the formula, because there really isn't a formula. A lot of it is based on experience. Um, but it's really, you know, it's great when the partnerships come together. The quantitative, yeah, how, how is it really performing? We're, we're, we want to test. We want to work with architects who want to test things. But then we want to come back and we want to say, is it really working? Is it doing the right things? And I think that's certain things like on urban planning, what we've learned, you know, we have this whole movement of, it used to, villages used to be very integrated. Housing was next to where you worked or was where you worked. And um, schools were right there. And then we developed this idea on the city that, oh, residential's over here and our commercial business district's over here and our retail's over here. And it's causing failures of cities. Um, you know, you're having areas where I, my, my rule of thumb on is urban planning working is, is the Starbucks open on Saturdays? Because if Starbucks is not open on Saturdays, it means there's nobody there. It's a dead zone. It's wasted space. You have, you know, days of which there's nobody around. Um, and we're not using our real estate appropriately. So that, that, oh, that whole idea of how we have to mix up things, you know, bring back retail into housing, into education. Um, I think that's going to be one of those things that kind of shifts it up. But, but the, uh, you know, to that point of that really is qualitative. We don't have the exact formula, but we shouldn't. It's gonna, nature changes all the time, and I think that's the other thing that we have to recognize is that we always need to be evolving this. We always need to be testing it. We always need to be trying new things. Absolutely. Could you pass along to Justinian? Because I think what, what was interested in, in your presentation, particularly Justinian, was the idea of scales, no? And exactly as Kirsten just said, there is a scale of, of migration that happens within a city from potentially a residential area to a commercial area, and, and that is somehow as important. I mean, I always love the idea that, you know, in the, in the 17th century, your world was as far as the, as the closest church steeple, because you perhaps didn't walk further than the next village. And now, obviously, our world is defined increasingly within a certain economic class of people by the, the, the condensed nature of, of the airline and the airport. And I'm also fascinated by the, the design of airlines as well. And I know that Migrant Journal, which is an exceptional series of publications, by the way, has focused 
uh, on the idea of the air and, and the water and, and the sort of the vehicles and mechanisms by which we travel. Increasingly, a simple idea to integrate is often through infrastructure, whether that's on the scale of a city, on the scale of a, of a skyscraper, or also on the scale of a continent. Maybe you could touch a little bit on, on your, your understanding of that. Well, first of all, I completely agree with the fact that, I mean, the daily commute between work and home, which is obviously very important uh, in, in the UK which, and in the US, where it's based on the suburban uh, uh, dream, uh, suburban way of life, which is also really strong uh, in France, uh, even though it's less present culturally, let's say. Um, it's called pendulum migration. It's the migration you do on a daily basis. And I think that's completely part of, the f of those phenomena, of those phenomena that, that we have to deal with on a daily basis. It's a very small scale, but it's a really important one. And it's something that brings a lot of questions. Uh, at the moment, I'm living in, in Paris, and I do have to travel sometimes uh, to a a suburbs somewhere close-ish. And it takes an hour to go to a suburbs 19 miles away from Paris Central. Uh, it takes two hours 15 to go to London. It takes one hour to go to Lille. And obviously, those different scales and the way they are privileged by different governments and their relationship to a certain extent to migration as well, because the same situation as in Stockholm, you have a strong relationship between the distance to the city center and you know, ethnic, uh, 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 ethnic belonging or ethnic groups you, you belong to, even though it's a very touchy, complex issue, especially in France, because you don't have available data on these issues. But you, you, you can see, you, you know that. It's a cultural phenomenon that everybody's familiar with. Um, and it's also something I always like to, to bring back into the discussion. Um, Tomorrow you'll have uh, Mike uh, Emmerich of Crimson Architecture uh, talking about cities of comings and goings where I've contributed the chapter on London. So I've, I've refrained from talking about it, but I, I, I'm sure that he will uh, tomorrow uh, afternoon. And in the 19th century in Victorian London, uh, the migration was migration from within the UK. Uh, so you had people uh, coming from other parts of the country, moving to London for different reasons. Uh, mainly to find work, but also for the, the amusement, for the joys of metropolitan life, for the pleasures, for the concerts, for, for, for also for the alcohol, for whatever, uh, you know, all the different elements that you could get in a city that you could not, cinema, that you could not get in other, uh, other parts more rural of, of the UK. At the time, these specific, those specific groups of people uh, were considered a bonus for the city because they were more healthy and the life in London was so detrimental to the body that people would, like uh, employers would prefer hiring uh, people from the countryside and hiring people who were London born. Uh, so again, it, it, it brings a lot of different questions uh, uh, and the, 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 those who were perceived as migrants were probably working class people who used to move around the city and move to slums from slums uh, there were obviously London-born people moving from slums to slums in order to fetch work on a daily basis, so casual work on a daily basis, and they were, th they were seen as a dangerous, they were seen uh, as the, 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 the detrimental group in a, in, a, in a country. And to come back to the issue of scale, so yes, I think it's, it's really, it's fascinating, uh, it's really important, and once again, being here today uh, uh, in Latvia, to be being here today in, in Riga, the, the country has a population of around 2 million, I believe. Uh, uh, so of course, when you compare that to a city like London, which is 7.5 million, it brings a lot of questions. It brings a lot of interesting elements to challenge. It's not about comparing one to the other in terms of who's best or not. It's about what does it mean to belong to a community of 2 million? Uh, what does it mean to move to a city of 7.5? Uh, how do you approach that? How are your uh, social relationships shaped by the size of the city? In London, it's not a choice, but I live in South London, and most of my friends live in South London. It's not that I dislike people who live north. It's not that I decide not to, be bit, not to become friends with those living north. But naturally, you will see more often those who live closer to you, because it's such a pain to go to North London uh, when you live in the south, uh, that naturally you will get stronger social ties with those that live around you, uh, you will share a common approach to a given city, uh, and that's how you will develop your, your social network and your network of relationship. Um, 
So yeah, I don't have. I could go on and on with yeah, this show of scale you, you because raise, it's, a, it's a fascinating one. You raise a interesting point that London, like most cities, um, in terms of the social interactions that you that you you have and the life that you build, is defined by geological structures such as this massive river that slices north from south. Um, to bring that maybe into this kind of the virtual world as as you describe it, Eva, I wonder whether you, the narrative that you constructed was absolutely conspicuously on the dark side of, of the web, which you know is is a very important thing to, to understand. Um, however, reform of Silicon Valley, you said, is not possible in the public sector. Um, the, the, the structures that are, that are being developed now through the, the, the companies that are based in Silicon Valley are somehow like what you described as Indian and somehow very much different to the fact that you are not meeting someone uh, who might be your neighbor more than you're meeting someone far away. And exactly as you said with your sons, Kirsten, I mean, I thought it was a very beautiful point to say that, well, I don't mind going far away because I know someone, I feel safer. Very, very interesting idea um, to raise. From your perspective, what does this, this, this new world uh, mean at a point in which you describe the European Union regulating, and then we just look at other governments sort of deregulating, or we have surveillance states like China just not giving any option? I mean, the idea of the social credit score, as you raised, which is critically related to migration in the sense that if you have bad behavior in Beijing, you will not be able to buy a train ticket out of Beijing, let alone a flight ticket. You are imprisoned or you are caged in a, a local environment. I mean, what I was trying to say earlier with you as well is that maybe you can be a little bit, maybe from your vast knowledge and experience, you can also just predict a little bit. Um, you don't have to because predictions are, are dangerous in some situations, but predict a little bit what, where we are going. Where, where are we going? in a situation in which the global and the local are, are absolutely at odds? I guess yes and no. I mean, you can be, I think the phenomenon of this time is that you can be pretty much anything at the same time. I don't even, you know, if you go a few steps further and you start to speak about augmented reality, you can put the whatever glasses, whoever will, I mean, Google has some uh, I name, I don't remember, but I'm sure there will be more. And you can sit in your apartment and maybe put it on and a few hours spent, I don't know, in Dubai. And you get your experience and, I mean, all of that is coming. It's going to be there. It's those all innovations will come. And so we will be, we might not even go to our neighbor, whichever part. We can just put glasses on and, you know, have a experience with him sitting in whichever sofa at home. So. I find it really exciting because it's a very, very enormous potential and there will be so many of those things coming out. At the same time, I find it very challenging of from the very human perspective and all of those sort of uh, liberties and freedoms and safeties and who are ourselves as self. Like, you know, in China, you are very much defined by somebody else or by algorithm in that case, you know, who keeps collecting data and then putting you in certain box. You know, you can fly, you can't fly. I mean, the latest I heard actually is that they even monitor how much you take toilet paper. And so it's like, it's a lot of uh, outside the definition who you are. On the other hand, I don't want to say that the surveillance capitalism is bad, but it's getting bad to my understanding because some of those decisions also in Western parts of the world are made by algorithms and not only in, on the social media which picks up the news that you're supposed to read because he, he knows what you want to read and what you're interested so it keeps pushing you into that direction. But it comes also, you know, data are sold to say third parties. Insurance companies start to look up what are your habits, how is your health doing. I mean, people start to make judgments of you and putting in certain boxes you without you even knowing that. And that yeah. happens in a free democratic world too. And there is, there is a business model. This is a very famous business model that nowadays sort of serves for everything. So that is all that side that concerns me, not only from security, you know, the fact that somebody can do something bad to me, but even as an as identity on being myself and having that freedom 
to make choices, to make, I mean, to fail with my choices and rather than to have everything prescribed and recommended and framed by algorithm. That I find a very scary, uh, scary sort of future, future yeah. path that we obviously are going there, you know. I read uh, and I had a chance to meet the architect a few days ago of the one who designed the Edge building in mm. uh, Amsterdam. You know, with all those uh, 10,000 sensors who actually tell you in the morning which desk you should be taking because he knows what's your schedule of the day. And that's where, I mean, it calculates your, the most optimized use of the space and all the, all the great features. Yet it makes me feel a little bit whether am I still human or am I moving into becoming a, a robot, not in self that I have transformed myself, but there's so much in a life that has been defined by others. Mm. While I actually would not mind sometimes make a wrong choice and come into the wrong place and, you know, we humans are learning from failures to make the right decisions. So this is something that philosophically scares me, but it's, we are going there. Yeah, I mean, just as a final point before we open up some questions from the audience <laughs> briefly, I just want to, I mean, maybe a final question to, to all of us is, is yes, I, I agree with you entirely, but I mean, how different is that kind of definition from an outside source to, to a nation state? I mean, this is also the question, we're all from different places in the world, we have different national identities, I imagine we grew up in different places, um, and I do wonder at a time in which I, I do agree with you, we are being increasingly, as individuals and groups, defined by algorithmic sources and, and, and supranational systems that are mainly capitalist-based. But the, you know, the idea of being British, or the idea of being Swiss, or the idea of being Latvia, or the idea of being American, which is perhaps the greatest success story of, of the construction of a national identity, uh, how much have they dominated us? Maybe somebody was, wants to make a final comment before we open up. Justinian? The, um, the idea of a nation state is a fascinating one, which is fairly recent. Uh, it's 19th century, uh, the concept of a nation state. Uh, before that, it was mostly based on who was the ruler at the time and uh, what, was, what were the positions of that ruler. Um, it's a really fascinating book uh, called Imagine Communities as well by Benedict Anderson, which I recommend reading as well if you want to, to, to have a deeper understanding of, the, of those issues. Um, I don't have a, an answer to that I'm asking because I'm asking myself the same questions. And today I'm also, those questions in relation to anxiety that I've shared at the beginning of my presentations are very much my own. Uh, as today I'm asking where should I live? Uh, when I'm in France, I don't really feel at home anymore uh, because I've been living f away for so long. When I'm in the UK, I definitely do not feel part of that political community. I think I want to challenge it on a, on a daily basis. Uh, so it's very difficult as well for, for, for me uh, uh, to be there. Um, there are other issues at stake uh, which are really interesting and tragic at the same time. I grew up as, a, as an adult uh, as a very traditional uh, state-led French uh, guy believing in, in the power of the state and the regalian powers of the state. Uh, and now when I see issues in relation to Scotland, when I see issues in relation to uh, Catalonia, uh, I'm asking myself, what is the future? Are we really still going on for that model of a, na of a strong uh, dominating nation state that sends the police when a region, or when, when a group of people who identify themselves as a community uh, wants to gain independence and want to gain uh, more, 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 yeah, more independence? So I'm wondering what the state of tomorrow will, will look like, and therefore what the identity of tomorrow will look like. Are we aiming, are we going for the dismantlement of those nation states that we've, all, that we've known for 100 to, or 200 years, or 300 years, like the United Kingdom, which I doubt will survive the, the four nations that built, that uh, are the foundations of the United Kingdom. I, I doubt they will stay as a United Kingdom for the next 50 years ahead of us. Uh, I doubt Spain will survive in that way. I don't know about Belgium. I don't even know about, about France, even though at the moment um, issues of independence are not so strong, but they used to be uh, until 20 years ago. So I'm wondering, and that's where the role of architecture or the role of design, the role of design thinking could be interesting, is what are the upcoming political institutions? Uh, how are we going to develop 
new ways to build democracy? Uh, how are we to be able to invent new identities? And that's the very, I think for me, the very positive side of the difficult moment we're in with lots of instability, with lots of questioning about of democracy, about social media, about free press. Um, I think that's the really exciting part because I believe it will change dramatically in the next 50 or 100 years. So I'm also not a big fan of predictions, uh, but I, it, there's something coming down at the moment. So what will be the next, what will be the next step is gonna be really, really interesting to, to look at and to build really together. Absolutely. Well, predictions are fictions or narratives, and I think that that has an important role to play. But I, we have time for maybe one or two very, very brief questions, like three words. No, I'm joking. Yes, down here. I think there's a microphone just coming your way. Okay, thanks. It works. Uh, my name is Victoria. I'm an architect, and I have a question to Kirsten, because you are talking about change in the way is how we work, how we buy, how we travel. But my question is the change for whom? Because I think uh, it's the change for just a small proportion of people who are economically capable or have relevant education that can work this way, whereas the majority of people, manual workers or maybe nurses or teachers, they have to work with certain people in certain places and there is a vast majority of people who just cannot um, cannot afford this lifestyle you were talking about. And also while talking about buying services instead of products, aren't we here talking just about the new phase of consumerism, which in fact remains the same, we just buy different things to make us happy. Thanks. Yeah, sure, so in, t in terms of you know, who actually is experiencing this opportunity to um, work where they wanna work. Right, and that, that we're not tethered so, so much, and the, clearly the first one is we're not tethered to the desk, so it is that kind of more the office worker, potentially educated high school, college um, at that level, but we're seeing it trickle down. There are, without a doubt, there are those, um, those infrastructures where you are tethered, I mean, like, like a hospital and a, and a nurse taking care, taking care of a patient. But even in those environments, you're seeing, you know, there's, you're moving around the hospital a lot more, that they're not, you know, you, you have, you can, you're, you're checking on the patient or the patient's checking on its service in, in kind of very different areas. So you're actually not stuck in one particular spot. You might be in a building. Think things like education. We always thought that education is going to be a teacher in front of a bunch of students. With massive online learning, that's changing. The number of people that are getting themselves educated um, in, in different areas, whether it's in particular in China and India and Indonesia, by this massive online learning programs is just enormous and really kind of educated into their self, self teaching themselves, they're self exposed as programs that are being offered by, you know, Harvard or by uh, Tianjin University or, or, you know, here in the Netherlands, um, or, or in the Netherlands and Europe, you have a number of those programs. So, so th they're, they're, it's providing a way for those who are migrant who maybe not have had that opportunity to actually sit in a, in a classroom to get educated. So I think you're gonna, what you're seeing is a shift, right? Where we have now, yes, there is that group that has a lot more flexibility on where they're working, but more and more and more are, are going to be getting there. It's never, it's not gonna be 100%. It maybe will be, will be able, you know, 75% are gonna have much more choice in how they do that, but there still will be those that, that are gonna be tethered. On the, the second part of your question was, Oh yeah, services versus versus goods, um, manufactured goods, and what we're seeing there, and, and you know, this probably is more of a United States sort of thing, where you were really judged by you know the uh, the car or how many cars you had or the size of the house that you had, um, you know the, those personal things, the the brands that you were wearing, and that definitely is shifting up. We are see seeing that all the way across, and people are saying it's not about you know, how big are the house is or how many cars do I have, but it really is my portfolio of my, um, my, my mark on the world is much more about where I've been, who I've met, what I've seen, what I've learned, what I've taught myself. It's an, it's an expense, yeah. I mean, you're spending, you know, you're spending your resources, your money, that's your salary, you're earning. But it's, it's definitely moving to, it's, it's not a physical thing that I'm buying and I'm sticking on a shelf, right? I'm spending money, I'm spend, you know, spending money on, the, on, on 
an airplane ticket or I'm spending money on uh, you know, eating out in a restaurant where I wouldn't have had before, but it's, 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 it's a passage of time, right? It's not that, it's not a physical, physical thing. Uh, okay, we have one more question. Shall we go here? Um, I'm not sure whether it's a, it's a question for everyone, but it's, uh, it uh, relates to the uh, concept of integration. And um, on a personal view, I, I'm a Latvian architect who's uh, actually lived in seven countries. And, uh, I, and I never found it that difficult. Obviously, education comes into it, but is integration doesn't necessarily mean changing oneself. To me, it means feeling comfortable and it means a, a, a question of mutual respect for what, who I am and for the country uh, and, uh, and, and its uh, customs and its character that I enter. Um, uh, I, I was uh, an immigrant uh, from the first generation of immigrants just after the Second World War to Australia via uh, refugee camps in Germany. And, and our generation of, uh, of immigrants were rather grateful to the countries that accepted us. We didn't require, we didn't ask for the countries to change to suit us. And I think that at least I'm not talking about the real refugees, but I'm talking about a lot of immigrants of, uh, that I've observed over the last uh, uh, couple of decades almost re uh, request or require that the country change to suit them. Well, anyway, I talk too much, but uh, perhaps you can comment on some of the things I've said. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I just wanted to jump on that and say, uh, for me, that, that been re that's been a really uh, interesting question that I've asked myself for the last 10 years living in the UK. So how, what is your position as a resident? How do you participate to public life? How do you participate to political life? I'm not threatened in any way, but I've always wondered myself, how much should I try to influence the country where I live in, where I pay my tax, because that's the, that's the phrase we, we use a lot in, in the UK. How much should I influence that country? How much should I try to change aspects of that country's culture, which I'm not confident with? Uh, how much should I be involved in local politics, even though I cannot, I mean, I can vote in local politics, but not in national politics. So how much can I be involved? How much can I express myself? How much can I, critique the country or, or emit criticism towards that country in which I live and where I'm being hosted. And I think it's uh, beyond the issue of changing a country because of your habits or because of the way you live or the things you eat or, or the religion you, be, you believe in. It's also like everyday questions uh, that are fairly innocent but that are actually quite interesting to ask yourself. Like, I live in that country. I was not born there. I don't have a passport for, for that country. So how much can I contribute? How much can I try changing it? Is it my role as an immigrant or should I, should I, should I shut up and just watch? Uh, and that's something that's been bugging me for, for a long time. Um, so that's what your comment kind of brings uh, into, into me. Any final comments? No? Well, we're a little bit over time. Everyone's starving. It's lunch, as far as I understand. Thank you so much to all of you for three incredibly fascinating presentations to start off this incredible conference. Round of applause and off to the food, I suppose.